As someone with limited cooking skills, I've always struggled to find healthy meals that taste good and don't take a long time to prepare, but Factor helps me avoid takeout and ordering in with delicious and nutritious, no-nonsense food that's ready quickly. Their meals come pre-prepared, ready to eat in two minutes, which is perfect for busy lifestyles. And if you want to try this out, head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code ATOZFILM50 and get 50% off your first Factor box and free wellness shots for life. Two free wellness shots from three available flavors for every order while you're an active subscriber. In this video, we are doing wide receiver rankings for the 2024 draft class. At this point, I've got 41 receivers graded. The minimum for me to give a grade on a player is watching three games of tape, and I usually try to watch at least five. There are a few, though, that have caught my attention that I haven't given a grade to, so I want to briefly mention them. David White out of Western Carolina really caught my attention at the Shrine Bowl. Jalen Coker out of Holy Cross I thought was less impressive at the Shrine Bowl, but he tested really well at the Combine, 42 and a half inch verticals, so definitely got to check him out. And then Ryan Flournoy out of Southeast Missouri State. I thought he was decent at the Senior Bowl. He had a really good combine performance, so I'll probably get around to him at some point. All right, we're going to start at the bottom of the list. Not going to spend a whole lot of time on the undrafted free agent guys. And by the way, I've got scouting reports finished for my top 30 receivers, so those will start popping up on the screen when we get to them. I've got three undrafted free agent grades, Jackson Jenke out of South Dakota State, Ramel Keaton out of Tennessee, and Tajon Paul. Palmer out of UAB. Jenky, I thought was an average athlete pretty good size, but not really a high level separator. Ramel Keaton, another player with good size, but very stiff movement skills. And then Tajon Palmer, another bigger receiver, really long arms, but he was probably the easiest cover at the Shrine Bowl. The next tier is priority free agents, and that's going to start with Tavion Robinson out of Kentucky. Very underwhelmed by his tape, doesn't have great play strength, not a refined route runner, and terrible drop issues. He had a drop or two at least in every game that I watched. Another janky twin, Jaden Jenke, is my 37th ranked receiver. Unsurprisingly, has a very similar skill set to his twin brother. I thought he had slightly better ball skills, so that puts him ahead. Drake Stoops out of Oklahoma is kind of a crafty route runner. If you ignore all the screens, which it felt like that was 70% of the time they gave him the ball, he's got some nuance and some shiftiness in the intermediate game, but he's one of the worst athletes in this class. 5'9 and a half, 186. He ran a 4'7", 30 inch vertical, 127 in the broad. Don't really see much of a ceiling with him. And then Xavier Weaver, I think, is a proficient route runner, but very much a finesse player. Play strength and physicality are major issues for him. He can get bodied by press coverage, and he's not very competitive at the catch point. I've got 34 draftable grades, so we're now into the seventh round, and my 34th ranked receiver is going to be Jordan Whittington out of Texas. He's a former five-star recruit. He's got really good size. He projects as more of a big slot possession receiver type. I just think there are real athletic limitations with Whittington. Don't really see him being a high-level separator in the NFL. NFL, but he plays with a lot of effort. He could be the kind of guy that sticks around for a while as like a fifth receiver or something. Georgia receiver Marcus Rosemey Jack Saint is my 33rd ranked receiver. In terms of his receiving ability, there isn't a whole lot of dynamic stuff on his tape. He's got an NFL ready frame, but just not someone that's really going to stress corners and man coverage. But he doesn't have a single drop in the past two seasons, and I thought he was the best run blocking receiver in this class. So I was initially a little bit higher on him. I think I had him like mid sixth round, but at Georgia's pro day, he ran a 484 in the 40 yard dash. I don't live and die by 40 yard dash times for receivers, but that actually is unplayable in the NFL. So he projects as more of a special teamer, back of the roster player at best. I've got two players in this next tier. The tiers are kind of arbitrary. I just tried to draw a line where it made sense. These are players that I think have some enticing traits, but it's just hard for me to see them really developing into a full time role. And that's going to start with my my 32nd ranked receiver, which is Jaquan Jackson out of Tulane. He's a deep threat slot receiver, very questionable play strength. I thought he struggled with press coverage when he faced it. The ball skills were way too inconsistent, and he just isn't a very refined route runner at this point. He was able to win some as a deep threat, but you've got to have more than speed to survive in the NFL, and he didn't test very well at the combine either. And then Devon Vale out of Utah is going to be my 31st ranked receiver. He's got a massive frame, 6'4", 33 and a half inch arms. When you turn on his tape, he's 
towering over Pac-12 corners, but then you press play and it kind of looks like he's moving in slow motion. I was pretty surprised that he ran a 4.47 in the 40 yard dash. He's one of those players where he runs this 40 and then Daniel Jeremiah says, oh, that's a good time for him. That's code for he's slow on tape, but ran an impressive 40 yard dash. He is somewhat of a skilled route runner, but the lateral fluidity is really lacking. I just don't think he has the juice to be a separator in the NFL. And he's an extremely old prospect. He's gonna be 26 years old as a rookie. I've got a tier of three kind of mid-round receivers. I think this is the start of where I would say I like these prospects for whatever that means. I could realistically see all of these receivers carving out some sort of role in the NFL. And that's going to start with my 30th ranked receiver, which is Anaya Smith out of Texas A&M. He's an undersized slot receiver, kind of moves like a running back with the ball in his hands. I thought he was very slippery and elusive after the catch. Very reliable catching the football. Only one drop this past season. I'll although he does have some limitations in contested catch situations. He's a shifty route runner, very quick in and out of breaks, and he also returned kicks and punts for Texas A&M. Smith is one of two receivers in this class whose grade is negatively impacted by injury concerns. He had a leg injury in 2022, and then at the combine, doctors discovered a stress fracture in his shin. So injury concerns for a smaller receiver is definitely something that's gonna impact his grade. And then at 191 pounds, I thought his speed on tape was was very average. At the time of this recording, it was reported that he ran a 448 at his pro day. The initial reporting of pro day times is just so unreliable. So I've got that on the graphic, but keep in mind that isn't verified. And yeah, if you're going to be undersized, I think you've got to have some kind of elite trait or skill to balance that out. And I just don't see that with Anaya Smith. At 29, we've got Bub Means out of Pittsburgh. Actually, the last player that I watched before recording this, I don't think he was on a lot of people's radars, but he had an outstanding combine performance performance at just under 6'1", 222 pounds with 33 inch arms. He ran a 4.43 in the 40, had a 39 and a half inch vertical. Outside of not having elite height, he really has everything you want from a size speed profile. I do think on tape, he has more build up speed than quick acceleration off the line of scrimmage. He's not gonna blow past a press corner right off the snap. He's more of a long strider that's gonna continue to gain speed and kind of outpace safeties that are closing in on him. He does a great job of maximizing his size at the catch point. He attacks the ball in the air, does a great job boxing out defenders. A common theme with a lot of these fifth round receivers I'm about to discuss is that they're undersized and they struggle to deal with physicality throughout the route, but Bub Means just powers through grabby coverage and continues to accelerate. And then I also thought he had some really nice releases off the line of scrimmage. There were a couple reps where he just got dominated by press coverage and knocked on his back, which is kind of concerning for a 220 pound receiver. But for the most part, very impressive footwork and nuance, lateral fluidity at the line of scrimmage. My concerns with Bub Means are just lateral twitch and being able to separate against man coverage. I wouldn't describe him as stiff moving laterally, but he's just lacking in suddenness in and out of his breaks. Pretty tight hips when he's trying to sink and cut off comeback routes. And then he just wasn't very productive in college, really until the second half of this past season. He started out at Tennessee where he had one snap as a freshman, transferred to Louisiana Tech, where where he was a backup rotational player, had average production in his first year, and then 718 yards and six touchdowns in 2023. So I like him as a big vertical threat, but as far as being a well-rounded complete receiver, I still think he has a ways to go. I've got Luke McCaffrey at 28, converted quarterback that really found a lot of success in his final season at Rice. He has elite focus at the catch point. His ability to track the ball in tight windows with defenders draped over him is as good as it gets. In his two seasons where he actually got playing time, he's had at least a 60% contested catch rate in both of those years. He actually has really short arms, but good size outside of that. And he projects as another big slot receiver in the NFL. About 70% of his snaps came in the slot at Rice. The interesting thing with his ball Ball skills uh, for as dominant as he was in contested catch situations he did a terrible job of bailing out his quarterback from inaccurate passes 16 of his targets over the past two years have been intercepted which is a crazy number I don't know if I've seen one that high and obviously that's primarily a quarterback stat but there were a lot of plays on tape where I felt like he could have done a much better job of working back to the football and playing some defense but my main issue with Luke McCaffrey is that he just hasn't really shown the ability to separate against a man coverage. Part of that's based on the route tree that he ran in college. There weren't a ton of intermediate breaking routes, but I just didn't really see the necessary level of twitch and fluidity that he's going to need to win in the NFL. At the combine, he did have
have elite numbers in the short shuttle and three cone. And I like his awareness against zone coverage. Um, he does a really good job of extending his routes when the quarterback breaks outside of the pocket. So I could definitely see him playing a role and being someone that coaches were comfortable putting on the field, but he's not very dynamic with the ball in his hands. He doesn't have field stretching speed. Outside of the contested catch skills, I'm just not sure there's many elite traits there. We've got a massive tier coming up, which is basically just small slot receivers. I was finishing up some of these reports before recording this video, and I had to make sure not to repeat myself because I think there's a lot of similarities between some of these players' skill sets. But this tier is going to start with Illinois receiver Isaiah Williams, who's my 27th ranked receiver. Very refined route runner, sudden in and out of his breaks. He's 5'9", 184 with just over 30 inch arms. So like a lot of the players in this tier, he struggles with physicality down the field and he's not very effective winning through contact at the catch point. I think he's a very skilled ball carrier. He does a great job weaving through traffic, identifying running lanes. He can catch those five yard hitch routes with his back to the defense and anticipate a crashing defender spin out of that tackle. I think Williams could come in and be an NFL caliber intermediate separator from the slot. What has him at the bottom of this tier is that he's just not much of a vertical threat. I don't really think he's going to pull away from man coverage on a slot fade, for example. And then he's another player that has kick and punt return experience, but he has three muffs over the past two seasons. Next up at 26, we've got Taj Washington out of USC. I really like Taj Washington's tape. Again, undersized slot receiver. He's just under 5'10", 177 pounds. Very short arms, just under 29 inches. That really limits his catch radius. And for a player of his size, he's just an average athlete. I thought his initial burst off the line of scrimmage was pretty good, and he has adequate speed to separate vertically, but especially if he's getting tight press man, it did feel like just that subtle grab on the jersey was enough to slow down his momentum and corners were able to keep up with him pretty frequently. But if you give him like off coverage against a flat footed corner, he can blow right past them. But with Taj Washington, he's just got extremely reliable hands, one drop on 74 targets this past season. As a route runner, I think he has, again, adequate change of direction skills to separate, but he's not as much winning with his quickness. I think he's more winning with nuance and technique. He does a really good job of setting up his route breaks and manipulating corners. As someone that played 90% of his snaps in the slot, he didn't face that much press coverage, but when he did face press, I thought he was very effective winning clean releases. And then over the course of his career, he has 462 career special team snaps in pretty much every phase. So that will definitely bump up his value. And I also thought he was pretty much uncoverable at the Shrine Bowl. At wide receiver 25, I've got Jamari Thrash out of Louisville. He actually played on the outside in college, but it's a fairly similar conversation to Taj Washington and Isaiah Williams. He has decent height, but he's 185 pounds with pretty short arms. And you really see him struggle to survive contact as a route runner. He gives you pretty much nothing on contested catches. He was three for 19 this past season. And there were a couple nice reps, but for the most part, he just gets overpowered as a run blocker. But the juice and snap that he has as a route runner was so impressive. He has the fluid hips to cut off routes at sharp angles, but he's also very technically sound with his footwork. And then you see the same thing on curls and comebacks, just effortless instant hip sync to cut those routes off. He's got breakaway speed, very difficult to make contact with and press coverage, and he's very creative and elusive after the catch. So you definitely would have liked him to have better testing at his size. We'll see if he can bump those numbers up at his pro day. And there are definitely limitations here as far as being like the central focus of a team's passing offense. But I thought some of the flashes on Jamari Thrash's tape were pretty exciting. Taking a break from the small receivers, we've got Cornelius Johnson out of Michigan coming in at wide receiver 24. Johnson and Taj Washington, I thought were the two most impressive receivers at the Shrine Bowl. They won essentially every one-on-one -on -one rep. He's 6'2", 213 pounds, above 70th percentile in every drill that he did at the Combine. I think his one like elite trump card trait is his deceleration. Outside of Malik Neighbors and probably Lad McConkey, I think you could argue that Cornelius Johnson has the best deceleration in this class. There's just no stall or rigidity cutting off those vertical routes. Kind of an interesting profile as far as ball skills. 
He's got an 11% career drop rate, very small hands at 8.5 inches. So that is something that I would probably expect to continue in the NFL, but he was nine for 11 on contested targets in 2023, by far the best in this class. He has the tracking ability and body positioning skills to win at the catch point. He just has a lot of focus drops on tape. We'll get into another Michigan receiver later, but I actually thought a common theme with that receiving core was just a lack of rhythm and efficiency as a route runner. There are times that you'll see Cornelius Johnson have the fluidity to separate in the quick game, but some other examples of just sloppy footwork and poor salesmanship. And he wasn't very productive at Michigan, but that's just going to be the case for anyone that doesn't play running back. So I'm not counting them off too hard for it. All right, back to the undersized receivers. At 23, I've got the smallest receiver in this class, which is Jacob Cohen out of Arizona. 5'8 and a half, 165 pounds, just over 29 inch arms. I sound like a broken record, but it is kind of the point that a lot of these extremely undersized receivers suffer from the exact same problems. His routes can get derailed by downfield contact. If he's facing catch coverage where the corner's like five to six yards off the line of scrimmage and they're just waiting for him to come to him, he'll be at full speed and then come to a screeching halt when the corner makes contact. And then he just gets shielded from the ball in contested catch situations. So a lot of the similar concerns that's kind of limiting Jacob Cohen's grade to the fifth round. But man, outside of that, this dude's tape is electric. He's got blazing top speed, ran a 4.38 in the 40 yard dash. That definitely shows up on tape. And with all of these undersized receivers that we've talked about, I've said that they're good separators. Jacob Cohen is by far the best that we've discussed up to this point. The fact that he's so light on his feet, that allows him to run more complex routes with advanced footwork. He can give a couple steps to attack a defensive back's leverage and not really lose any momentum or struggle changing directions. He darts out of his breaks, consistently creates separation on outbreaking routes, especially Especially. And I think he's one of the best receivers in this class at the top of the route. So a couple steps before the break point of manipulating corners and setting up his breaks. He can stem in a straight line in one direction at the last second, change speeds, give a couple steps the opposite way, and then break back out to his original angle. Off coverage corners facing Jacob Cohen are just living in hell. And then even though he does project as a slot only, he was very effective against press coverage, definitely a technician at the line of scrimmage. So I think most receivers at this size, they're going to start getting the tank Dell comps, but I think that's a good high-end comparison for Jacob Cohen. At wide receiver 22, I've got Brendan Rice out of USC. He has good size, but pretty below average athletic traits. He does a good job with his footwork of maximizing his separation ability, but he's just lacking the juice to consistently separate at a high level. Even when he's doing the right motions, you know, the lateral movement skills are just too clunky. He's really good at beating press coverage. He's got great hand usage at every level of the field and he only had two drops this past season you can tell that he's a well-schooled receiver but he's not much of a yak threat again average athletic traits has good size but I thought the play strength was lacking and he wasn't very effective winning contested catches so I think Rice is probably going to end up somewhere in the wide receiver four to three range my 21st ranked wide receiver is one of my guys in this class and that's Anthony Gold out of Oregon State he's 201 on the consensus board I I think he's one of the most underrated players in this class. On tape, you see the explosiveness and the deep speed. He confirmed that at the combine with a 92nd percentile 10 yard split, 439 in the 40 yard dash, 39 and a half inch vertical, 129 inch broad, sub 7 3 cone, solid 416 in the short shuttle. Take a drink because again, he's undersized, 5 foot 8, 172 pounds, short arms. Until we get to Xavier Worthy, this is the last like extreme size outlier that we're going to cover. But of all the similar sized players in this range, Jacob Cohen, Jamari Thrash, Taj Washington, Isaiah Williams, Anaya Smith. Anthony Gold is the one that I'm betting on early day three. He combines this elite athleticism with just being a technician as a route runner. He can use rocker and pressure steps without sacrificing any momentum. He snaps out of his breaks. He just terrorizes press coverage. He's got so many different releases in his bag. He just makes press corners look silly. Another player that's not going to be this elite ball winner through combat contact, but he does have really good tracking skills deep down the field. And then he gives you value as a kick and punt returner as well. Really his one issue that doesn't have to do with size is that he's just 
average on curls and comebacks. For a deep threat, you wanna be able to put that vertical stress and then cut that off and get five to six yards of separation. He isn't stiff in that area, but not as fluid as you would like to see. Next tier, I've got two players that I like, but I'm definitely lower on them than consensus. And that's gonna start with Tez Walker out of UNC, who I don't think I'm that much lower on him at this point. After his senior bowl performance where he just couldn't catch anything, a lot of people kind of jumped off the train. He's got good size, kind of a lanky build, but long arms and elite speed and explosiveness, which he backed up at the combine. Outside of just outrunning corners and winning down the sideline, I don't really think there's a whole lot that he brings to the table. There isn't much nuance or setting up of his breaks when he does run intermediate routes. He really struggles to sink and decelerate, which is a massive problem for someone that's gonna project as a deep threat. If you can't threaten corners vertically and underneath, they're just gonna play off and bail and make sure they stay over the top. He's got a major issue with focus drops, he flashed the ability to win in contested catch situations, but he wasn't overly efficient in that area. He's got a decent speed release, but not much else to beat press coverage. And then he gives you pretty much nothing after the catch. He was one of the least effective yak receivers in college football last year. So Tez Walker is more of a player that I would add as a complimentary piece to an already built receiver room. If you just like need a number one receiver, I wouldn't take Tez Walker and expect him to be that. And then I've also got Malachi Corley out of Western Kentucky at wide receiver 19. This is the first player that's in my top 100, so about one-fifth of my top 100 is receivers. And I think at this point, Corley is probably the player that I'm lowest on relative to consensus. I've got the three comps as Debo Samuel, LaVisca Chenault, and Amari Rogers. This is a good example of how my NFL comparisons are not for the quality of player, it's more just play style. And that's kind of what I see the range of outcomes as being for Malachi Corley. But the reason he gets comped to Debo Samuel so much is that Debo's the only receiver in this archetype that's really been able to establish a full-time role in the NFL. So if you're trying to make a Malachi Corley comparison and you don't want to be disrespectful, it's like you can go Debo Samuel or maybe Rasheed Rice now. He's built like a running back, 5'10 and a half, 215 pounds. 45% of his targets last year were either screens or jet sweeps. So pretty much his entire role in Western Kentucky's offense was just get him the ball, let him create after the catch. And he's really effective with the ball in his hands. He's got good contact balance. He'll truck defenders in the open field. He has breakaway speed to finish big plays in the end zone. And on open targets, I thought he had solid hands. He had a 7.1% drop rate this past season, which is a little bit higher than you want, but he does a good job of attacking the ball in his air, catching with full extension. And there are flashes where he'll show the change of direction skills that he he would need to develop into more of an NFL route runner. Those are really all of the positive things that Malachi Corley brings to the table. And I just don't think that's enough to take him earlier than like late third round. The yak skills are really good, but I wouldn't describe it as special. I think Rondale Moore, for example, was more dynamic with the ball in his hands than Malachi Corley. He gets talked about like he's this generational yak threat. I mean, he forced 15 missed tackles this past season on 79 receptions. He's strong and powerful as a runner, but the elusiveness is just above average. He's one of the worst contested catch receivers in this class. He has a career contested catch rate of 26.5%, very uncomfortable tracking deep targets. At the top of routes, he's unable or unwilling to separate with just footwork. He runs himself into contact, lets corners get back in phase. Unless it was a design double move, he didn't show a whole lot of nuance to manipulate corners' hips and set up his breaks. So he's a decent player, but in this receiver class especially, I mean, he's 59th on the consensus board. I just did not think his tape or his performance at the Senior Bowl really warrants that. On to my tier five receivers. We're gonna start this off with a player that I've actually had listed as a tight end for most of the draft process, Johnny Wilson out of Florida State. I moved him back to receiver because at the Senior Bowl, at the Combine, he was doing everything with the receivers. It seems like that's where he's gonna play in the NFL. I would definitely prefer him at tight end, but we'll just stick to what seems like is gonna happen. He's probably the biggest receiver in NFL history. His height, weight, and arm length, they're all 99th percentile. Six foot six with over 35 inch arms. That's just a historic catch radius. His ability to pluck away inaccurate throws, I've just never seen anything like it. But then he 
combines that with just terrible drop issues, 12.8% career drop rate. It's been over 10% every season of his career. You just can't trust him to secure easy throws, and that's continued to be a persistent issue over the course of his career. He has a really interesting combination of power and finesse as a receiver. For someone that's 6'6", 231 pounds, he has really loose hips at the top of the route. He can shake defenders and create pretty good separation on in-breaking routes. I think his footwork is very controlled and efficient as a route runner, and he does a good job using his size to his advantage to extend separation. His best way of beating press is just a hard two-hand strike to the cornerback's chest, try to knock them back five yards and then accelerate upfield. He actually had some success with that in college. He was able to kind of ragdoll some smaller corners, but outside of that, it's just so easy for corners to get their hands on his frame. If he's trying to shake you at the line of scrimmage, that is such a big target to land your punch. And it's actually the main original reason that I had him converting to tight end. He's pretty stiff coming to a stop. He does doesn't have great speed to separate vertically. And despite his size, like I said, he's got the drop issues, but also kind of inconsistent physicality at the catch point. He's definitely a tough player to project because we haven't seen too many receivers in this archetype. You've got guys like Auden Tate that are just stiff as a board, but they're really big. But with Johnny Wilson, it's just a really weird combination of strengths and weaknesses. Wide receiver 17 is gonna be Roman Wilson out of Michigan. He's 49th on the consensus board. A lot of people are big fans of Roman Wilson. Before the Senior Bowl, I actually had a much lower day three grade on him than this. He was comfortably the best receiver in Mobile but I thought his tape was pretty average. He does have good straight line speed and reliable hands. I don't feel like he offers a whole lot more than that though. At 5'10", 186, like being fast, that's the bare minimum expectation. On tape, I thought he was an unpolished route runner. Same thing we were talking about with Cornelius Johnson, where he's either clunky with his footwork, he's taking too much time to get into his break, he's kind of stumbling into contact at the top of the route. At the Senior Bowl, he showed some short area quickness to, I think, develop into more of a high level separator. That's why I have, has the quickness to separate out of horizontal breaks and the strengths because I think he has the athletic ability. He just has to refine that area of his game. He isn't very effective after the catch, only had two broken tackles last year. He struggles with press coverage when he does face it and physical coverage down the field can throw him off balance. So I see Roman Wilson as he is now, as someone that can win on deep overs and slot fades, but only if the corner promises not to press him at the line of scrimmage. If he cleans up his footwork and tightens up his route running a little bit, I think he could definitely be more than that, but I don't see the athletic athletic traits as being special enough to where I'm, you know, taking that in the top two rounds. So decent player, seems to be a good leader, definitely has some room to grow, but I see him as more of a fringe top 100 type of guy. I've got Javon Baker out of Central Florida at wide receiver 16. He's 6'1", 202, good length, has the ideal size for an X receiver, and he's one of the most interesting players in this class. He's an Alabama transfer. He has extremely creative footwork as a route runner or against press coverage. He's got so many different ways of releasing off the line of scrimmage. He just attacks cornerbacks hips, attacks their leverage, makes them so uncomfortable trying to mirror him down the field. He can sink and stop instantly. He's got good play strength as a route runner. And then if you just watch his highlights, especially some of the contested catches that he's able to pull off are incredible. He's got the focus, the size, the physicality to win difficult contested catches. But with all of those strengths that I just mentioned, you'll actually see the opposite thing show up on tape pretty frequently. He has an 11 0.4% career drop rate. He'll make some incredible acrobatic receptions and then drop an easy slant route the next play. He had multiple easy drops that actually got deflected and ended up as interceptions. The advanced footwork is pretty impressive, but he definitely needs to limit his freestyle approach. There are some times that it looks like he's just trying to pull off the most aesthetically pleasing release instead of actually creating separation. I'm sure he had more freedom to do that in UCF's offense than he will in the NFL, so it's not like a major negative, but you would like to see him be able to win more efficiently. And then he's just a very average athlete. Change of direction is probably his best athletic trait, but his top speed is pretty limited. He can stack corners off the line of scrimmage, but they'll be able to keep up with him down the sideline. So that could limit some of his big play potential. Overall though, I really like Javon Baker. I see him as like a carbon copy of Michael Gallup, and you're taking this guy to be a mid-range wide receiver too. And then final player in this tier is gonna be my wide receiver 15, which is Malik Washington out of Virginia. He's 5'8", 190, 
91 pounds with short arms, but he doesn't suffer from a lot of the same issues as the other undersized receivers that we've discussed up to this point. He had an elite 2.6% drop rate in 2023. The year before, his drop rate was 1.5%. You can trust this guy to reliably bring in open targets, but he also had one of the highest contested catch rates in this class at 65%. He has exceptional focus at the catch point. He does a great job of maximizing his size and high pointing the ball. And then he's a powerful runner after the catch. In a lot of ways, I think Malik Washington is kind of what people think Malachi Corley is. Watching Washington's tape was the experience that I was expecting going into Corley's tape. He led college football with 35 broken tackles in 2023. My sort of comparison for him is a spring doorstop. When he's bracing for contact, he will just plant his foot in the ground. Defenders will come at him high. They'll kind of bend him to the ground and then he'll just snap right back up. The contact balance with Malik Washington is elite, at least for his size. He's an efficient route runner, not the most dynamic getting out of breaks. He's got crisp horizontal breaks, not much wasted motion, but I wouldn't describe his nuance and technique as advanced. The exception of that is when he runs these out and up double moves. He has great salesmanship and body language on those. And you see his ability to flash outside and then explode upfield. I think he definitely has the potential to add more nuance as a route runner. I wish he had a little bit better speed. He's kind of a short strider with choppy steps. His speed kind of tops out at a certain point, it feels like. He is very explosive though. He reaches that top speed quickly. And you see that with his 42 and a half inch vertical jump at the combine. I do think he's a slot only though at this point, because on top of being undersized, he doesn't have much of a plan at all to defeat press coverage. Again, he doesn't face it that often in the slot, but his strategy is to kind of just try to run through it which you can't really do that effectively at 191 pounds. We've got a pretty significant jump here up to tier four, which is gonna start with Jalen McMillan out of Washington. I see him as a very similar player to Jacoby Myers as a big slot receiver, a good but not great athlete that is ideally gonna be a team's second option in the passing game. I was really impressed by his salesmanship as a route runner. He understands leverage. He understands where he wants the corner to be facing to optimize his break. The footwork is just so detailed in his routes and he has the lateral fluidity to separate at a high level. A consistent theme with all of the Washington receivers, they are just experts at changing tempo as the route develops. He can just seamlessly adjust his speed to manipulate corners. My main issue with Jalen McMillan is I think he just has average ball skills, but overall a very well-rounded and I think high floor receiver prospect. And then one spot higher on my total big board is Troy Franklin out of Oregon coming in at wide receiver 13. For these players that I've done full scouting reports on, I'll be a little bit more brief in my breakdown. If you want to see my full thoughts, you can go check out that video. But Troy Franklin was one of the most productive receivers in college football this past year. He's tall, fast, and struggles to catch the ball, which initially sounds like a pretty similar profile to someone like Devontae Walker, but I think Troy Franklin offers a lot more in terms of skill and technique. Even though he is in the deep threat archetype, he's not just running in a straight line down the field. He has graceful footwork against press coverage. He uses this walk release to attack soft shoe press, where he slow plays the release initially, closes that space, and then accelerates past their outside shoulder. He's a decent route runner on non-vertical routes. I don't think that's a major strength for him. But again, I do want to draw the distinction between Troy Franklin and like Tyquan Thornton. But my biggest issue with Troy Franklin and the reason that I'm lower on him than consensus is the ball skills and how he deals with physicality. He had a 10% drop rate last year. Didn't really look natural catching the football, tracking it deep down the field, which ideally is going to be a major aspect of his game in the NFL. He would get boxed out by defenders deep down the field He'd also let corners shield him away from slants. Watching Troy Franklin's tape just didn't give me a whole lot of confidence that he's going to catch the football consistently in the NFL when the corners are a lot bigger. And then I think he's really good at beating soft shoe press where the corner isn't jamming immediately at the line of scrimmage. But when he did face more physical corners with some length, they were able to get into his frame and neutralize his releases. You also see that down the field. Again, these receivers that are sub 180, but they run really fast. That speed isn't really the same if you've got a corner on your hip tugging at your jersey. Now, if I went into a coma and woke up a year from now and you told me that there was one receiver in this class that I was completely wrong about, my first guess would be Troy Franklin because I can absolutely see the path to him being incredibly productive. If he figures out how to stop dropping passes, I think that would go a long way. I still don't see him as a true wide receiver one, but as a second receiver that's primarily a deep threat, I think he could be really productive in a high volume passing offense. My wide receiver 12 is Jalen Polk out of Washington. He's a really smooth player with 
for the most part, outstanding ball skills. Like I said with McMillan, I think Jalen Polk does a great job of adjusting his route tempo to set up breaks. On horizontal breaks, he can make crisp lateral cuts and get separation. I do think he struggles on stop routes to sit down and open up to the quarterback. And then he's one of the best hands catchers in this class. He measured in with just under 32 inch arms, which is decent, but 43rd percentile for a receiver. I was expecting his arms to be way longer than that just because of how aggressive he is attacking the ball in the air. And he can do that while he's contorting his body, falling backwards, defenders draped over him. He's got such a great balance of focus and aggression in contested catch situations. I don't think he does a very good job of using his body at the catch point as far as like boxing defenders out. So that does kind of limit his effectiveness. And then if you watch his tape, it's like smooth sailing for pretty much the whole season. And then he has this two game stretch week 12 and 13. They play Oregon State and Washington State. He was targeted 10 times and he had zero receptions. I think one or two of those were uncatchable, but there were a couple drops, a lot of just getting out physical at the catch point. Outside of that stretch, I thought ball skills were a major plus for him, but I don't know, maybe he had a hand injury or something. It doesn't really have like any effect on my grade. I'm willing to overlook a couple rough games, especially with as many games as Washington played this season. So yeah, Jalen Polk is a really talented receiver, just kind of average athletic traits though. Don't see him developing into a wide receiver one, but I'd be surprised if he wasn't at least productive in the NFL. And final player to discuss for this tier is Jermaine Burton out of Alabama, who's my wide receiver 11 and just cracks the top 50. Now, just based off of the tape grade, I would probably have Jermaine Burton as wide receiver seven, I think, and he'd be somewhere in the 30s to early 40s. But I did slightly reduce his grade based on some off-field concerns. In 2022, after the Tennessee game, they were storming the field and he hit a woman, which hot take is not a good thing to do. There's also some times on tape where you can see like after the play, he's doing some Grayson Allen stuff. He's laying on the ground, kicking someone, that kind of thing. Transferred from Georgia. I haven't heard as much buzz on him, you know, relative to how good the tape is. So we'll see how NFL teams view that. Out of every receiver in this class, he's definitely the person with the most writing on his interviews at the Combine. But as a player with Jermaine Burton, there is so much to like and not very many concerns. He had zero drops last year and just four for his career. I was really impressed by his ability to adjust to inaccurate passes, which uh, Jalen Milrow had plenty, especially early in the season. He'll high point the ball, take a massive hit from a safety over the middle of the field. They didn't have him running a super complex route tree where he could really show off his ability that frequently, but the potential with Jermaine Burton as a route runner, I think is really exciting. And it's potential in the sense that he just needs to be in an offense that's gonna let him run the full route tree. It's not like he has a lot of development that he needs. He's fluid sinking his hips. He has some routes where he looks like Garrett Wilson just cutting off a deep out at exactly a 90 degree angle. He does a great job changing his pace, advanced footwork to manipulate corners and set up his breaks. As a slightly undersized receiver, he doesn't really struggle that much with physicality. He only had 798 yards last year, but he just gets open. And then he's also really fast and explosive to win as a vertical threat. The main area of development for Jermaine Burton is I think diversifying his release package. He's pretty much only speed releasing. He didn't have major problems beating press in college, but I think he's going to need a little bit more than that. And then he isn't very productive after the catch, just three missed tackles forced this past season, and he averaged 3.4 yak per reception. On the field, I think Jermaine Burton is one of the most underrated and under-discussed receivers in this class. If he falls later than I have him ranked, I understand why that would happen, but NFL teams will just have to figure that out. Okay, we have arrived at the top 10 and the third tier of receivers in this class, which are receivers that I think have a good chance of being a wide receiver too. And that starts with Xavier Leggett out of South Carolina, pretty controversial receiver in this class, uh, just in the sense that there seems to be a wide split on how people view him. I would call myself a Xavier Leggett centrist. I think the first round is way too rich for him, but seeing him in the 70s and 80s is very surprising to me. I love the size speed combination with Xavier Leggett. He's built like AJ Brown, but actually probably runs a little bit faster than him. AJ Brown's much better after the catch and beating press coverage, so I don't think it's a one-to-one -one comp, but as far as body types, they are very similar. He had a breakout season in 2023, his fifth year in college after not doing very much his first four seasons. Brett Coleman had an informative thread on Twitter that gives a pretty good explanation for why Leggett had a late breakout. And normally late breakouts are pretty concerning for receiver prospects. You want guys that arrive at college and are productive 
either immediately or at least in their second year. The track record of one-year wonder senior receivers is pretty concerning. But for Leggett, I do think he has a valid explanation for the late breakout. He has really good ball skills, doesn't drop many passes. He has some just dominant reps, high pointing the ball deep down the field. But I think he has the potential to be more than just a fast contested catch receiver. In terms of athletic ability, he has the traits to be an effective separator in the NFL. He can throttle down and stop his momentum efficiently. He's violent, exploding out of route breaks. I don't think he's ever going to be running like blaze outs and seven stops and breaking ankles and stuff like that. But as far as just being an effective route runner, he has that natural ability and there's flashes on his college tape of him executing that at a high level. But with Xavier Leggett, you can tell that he's an inexperienced receiver. When you grade the flashes, it's obvious that he's capable of being a good route runner, but the footwork and attention to detail in and out of breaks is just not repeatable snap to snap. There's a lot of times he'll get to the top of the route seemingly with without a plan and he'll just kind of stumble in place for a couple seconds. I think he just needs more reps to really tighten up his footwork and be able to separate consistently. I also think he really struggles with press coverage. Again, he's got the size to absorb contact. He's got some of the lateral explosiveness, but not very coordinated footwork at the line of scrimmage and corners can take him out of the play. And he's okay after the catch. He can definitely outrun the entire defense, but as far as making defenders miss, he's not really that dynamic in the open field. So pretty tough player to get a read on. Uh, definitely one of the more difficult receiver evaluations in this class. The tape game to game is just so up and down. I think that's probably why there's so many split opinions on Xavier Leggett. You could easily just pick a three game sample size and think he's a top 20 player. You could pick a different three game sample size and have him outside of the top 80. Ricky Pearsall is my ninth ranked receiver in this class, 45th ranked player overall. He has below average measurements as far as size, but everything else at the combine was elite 664 in the three cone 42 inch vertical he looks like a good athlete on tape but he tested like an elite athlete he's a sudden efficient route runner really impressive ability to snap out of breaks i think he can run the entire route tree at a high level his double moves are incredible to watch he runs a lot of out and up routes and normally with those routes it's kind of like a subtle break to the outside before you accelerate downfield ricky pearsall sells that outbreak about as hard as you will ever see his entire body is accelerating full speed to the sideline. He gets the corners to bite and then instantly accelerates upfield. He doesn't drop passes. He did have a really bad fumble against Arkansas where he just got it uh, ripped out of his hands and they returned it for a touchdown. But outside of that, reliable hands made one of the best catches I've ever seen against Charlotte. I could see him struggling some with press coverage. I think his best fit is at Z. He has the footwork for it. It's just the play strength that's lacking. And I don't see him ever being a team's number one, but I think he's someone that can just cook single cover and be a high-end wide receiver too. At wide receiver eight, we've got another player that I just did a video on a couple weeks ago, so I'll be relatively brief on this. But my wide receiver eight is Xavier Worthy out of Texas. If you haven't heard, he set the combine record for the 40-yard dash, 421. He did run that at one of the lowest weights in combine history, so he's an extreme outlier, positively with his speed and negatively with his size. Everyone I've listened to talk about Xavier Worthy, I think has done a good job of making the distinction between Worthy and a player like John Ross. He's not just a straight line athlete track star that can't play the receiver position. What's even more impressive about Xavier Worthy to me, or at least equally impressive, is his joystick movement skills and his ability to change directions. That's why I think the closest NFL comparison for him is someone like Zay Flowers, where he's got that top speed, he can win vertically, the speed itself is gonna help to soften coverage and give him more space to work underneath, but where he's really gonna win is on comebacks and deep outs where he can get the receivers leaning downfield, snap it off instantly, and then you've got like six or seven yards of separation to the sideline. I think his hands are okay. He struggled with drops early in his career, but I think the drop issues with Xavier Worthy are not as bad as a lot of people make them out to be. His biggest issue is just a complete inability to win contested catches. Not only does his size limit his effectiveness at the catch point, he just doesn't really seem that instinctive or physical play playing the ball in the air, fighting for catch space. I think he's very limited as a run blocker. He struggles to deal with contact at the line of scrimmage. I like so much about Xavier Worthy's game, but there's just 
too many severe limitations for me to have him any higher than this. At seven, I've got Florida State wide receiver Keon Coleman. He was actually the first scouting report video that I did. And at the time I was way lower on him than consensus. Early in the season, he had a couple big games, some crazy highlight contested catches and everyone just put them in their top 10 on their boards. So I had high expectations going into his tape, but was very underwhelmed based on where everyone else had him. At this point though, everyone's kind of adjusted, watched the rest of his film. He's 31st on the consensus board. I have him 33rd overall. So basically the same ranking. And I think late first, early second is a perfectly fine draft slot to take Keon Coleman. Now there's a lot of discourse about his 40 yard dash. He ran a 461 with a 162 10 yard split. That's 15th and 13th percent tile respectively. I didn't expect him to run a super fast 40. I did think it would be a little faster than that. I feel like on tape, his speed is closer to below average than terrible. You saw him have the good miles per hour with the tracking data and the gauntlet drill. You've seen examples where he can outrun the entire secondary. For me, Keon Coleman's play speed is not really a major concern. It's not a plus, but I think by far the bigger issue is his route running. I think he has physical limitations as a route runner and that he's not that fluid or explosive in short areas. He rounds off his breaks. He's upright in his movements, but he also doesn't have much in the way of technique or nuance as a route runner. He does very little to set up his breaks or get the corner off balance, but he has really good hands and ball skills. The actual contested catch numbers are not that great for him. He was just 10 of 30 last year. You got to be careful with contested catch stats because it's already a small sample size that you're evaluating, but there's also a lot of plays that get charted as a contested target that aren't really indicative of what we're trying to evaluate. Jordan Travis has a bad habit of being inaccurate. So there's a lot of quote unquote contested targets that were really just uncatchable, but Keon Coleman kind of worked his way back into the picture. I think he's one of the two best run blocking receivers in this class. He just bullies corners and cleared the way for a lot of Trey Benson's biggest runs. So we've seen this archetype of player a lot. The results haven't been great, but there are some hits in there. He's a young player with really good ball skills, but he's gonna have to learn how to separate. And at the top of my third tier, I've got Georgia receiver Lad McConkey. He is the best route runner in this class, just in terms of separating against single coverage. He really has that rare special separation athleticism of a player like Antonio Brown. He's so fluid and effortless in and out of breaks, doesn't lose any momentum when he changes directions. Some of the corners and out routes that he was able to run are just mind blowing, like how he was able to snap it off that quickly. Now it's okay to comp a white player to another white player if they have similar skill sets, but some of the Lad McConkey comparisons that you see, you're just telling on yourself that you haven't watched one or both of the players that you're comparing. He's really nothing like a Julian Edelman or like Danny Amendola type of player. He's a true deep threat, a fast starter. He puts defenders on their heels right off the snap. That's an element of what makes his route so effective is that corners are worried about getting beat over the top. In the limited experience he had against press coverage, he was really effective and coordinated with his releases, but he was given mostly free releases at college. So he is gonna have to adjust to getting more contact at the line of scrimmage. After the catch, I think he has the perfect balance of the abrupt start stop ability to make defenders miss without having too much unnecessary dancing. He'll make the defender miss that's right in front of him, but then he's looking to get upfield and attack open space. He's not wasting time stringing together multiple missed tackles. My biggest concern with Lad McConkey is just being a small receiver that struggled to stay healthy, especially in his final year at Georgia. He didn't have great production, only two 100 yard games. I thought his ball skills were pretty good, but again, for an undersized receiver, he can kind of get crowded at the catch point, but he's just a special route runner. And if you could guarantee me that he was going to stay healthy for 14 games in a season, I would be comfortable taking him in the first round. My next tier of receivers is boom bust wide receiver ones. These are players that I think have the potential to be a top five receiver, but there's also a pretty significant bust factor. And at wide receiver five, I've got Brian Thomas Jr. out of LSU. Just as far as running a go route or a slot fade, I think he's clearly the best receiver in this class. He's a built in a lab deep threat, six foot three, long arms, 4-3-3 speed, super explosive off the line of 
contest scrimmage. He just torches press coverage for an inexperienced kind of ascending player. He's actually really refined with his footwork at the line of scrimmage. And he has flashes of dominance at the catch point, just high pointing the ball, dunking on corners. So I'm very confident that Brian Thomas Jr. will be an effective, explosive deep threat in the NFL. As far as being much more than that, I'm a little bit more skeptical. He's clunky in and out of breaks. He isn't very abrupt decelerating. Like I said, there are high end flashes at the catch point, but he doesn't consistently use his size and physicality. Besides just outrunning people and attacking open space, I don't think he's very dynamic after the catch. And there's a few high end run blocks on tape, but overall he's pretty disinterested in the run game. And then my wide receiver four is gonna be Adonai Mitchell out of Texas. I'm as high on AD Mitchell as pretty much anyone. He's kind of moved up to being a consensus first rounder after the combine, but I think he should have been a no brainer first round pick before then. He confirms his speed with a 4-3-4 in the 40 yard dash. I thought he'd run a good time. I was surprised people were questioning his speed, but I didn't expect 4-3-4. But it's a similar deal with the other Texas receiver where the speed is actually not the most impressive trait to me. What I like most about A.D. Mitchell is his ability to make sharp cuts and accelerate out of his breaks. He's a crisp, violent route runner, just explodes horizontally. He can beat press coverage. He catches pretty much anything. He's similar to Jermaine Burton, where there's a lot of plays where he's running like a sit route over the middle of the field. The ball gets there earlier than he expected, and he can just flash those late hands and pluck it out of the air. And then similar to Brian Thomas Jr., he flashes in contested catch situations, but I thought his physicality was inconsistent. As far as my concerns with A.D. Mitchell, a lot of his production came off of double moves, which I don't think is as sustainable in the NFL, but you see his ability to separate on other routes. I don't really think he would have a difficult time adjusting. The biggest weakness to his game by far is that he gives you pretty much nothing after the catch. The fluidity that he shows as a route runner doesn't continue when the ball's in his hands, and there are times that he won't even make an attempt to break a tackle after the catch. He does take routes off when he's on the backside of the play. Both of the Texas receivers do that, and in split field passing games like Texas, Tennessee, where they're only reading one side of the field, you will see that pretty frequently. I'm pretty sure it's approved by the coaches. I would definitely ask him about that if I was a coach or scout interviewing him, but I'm not as worried about that as some other people. And then my tier one is pretty chalk. I've got three receivers, starting with Roma Dunze at wide receiver three. Again, with these top guys, if you want to hear me talk about them for five or six minutes, I've got full scouting report videos up on the channel. But Roma Dunze is one of the best contested catch receivers that I've ever watched. Just elite ball tracking and play strength through contact. I think his contested catch success is more projectable to the NFL than someone like Hakeem Butler, for example. He's not winning these catches with just physical dominance over his competition. It's a lot more skill and technique and focus at the catch point. He's a technically sound route runner with efficient footwork. If he was asked to run a more diverse route tree than he ran at Washington, I think he could separate at a high level. But when he does get open, it's a lot more a result of nuance than explosiveness and lateral twitch. He tested really well at the combine. I don't think that athleticism quite showed up on tape. Not that he's a bad athlete, I just don't think he looked that explosive on tape. It felt like at Washington, he kind of struggled to pull away from corners down the sideline. That's part of why he had so many contested catch opportunities. I also think he struggled some with press coverage and needs to do more to add a horizontal threat at the line of scrimmage to try to widen corners out. But I just see such a high floor with Roma Dunze. Even if I don't project him as being a top five game changing type of receiver, it would shock me if he was anything less than a wide receiver too. And the confidence that I have in his floor relative to some other receivers in this class has him as a top 10 player on my board. I could definitely make the argument that the top two receivers should be in a tier by themselves, but I didn't want to do a one player tier, so I got them all grouped together. But my wide receiver two is Malik Neighbors out of LSU. We don't have any athletic testing for the top two receivers, but he's one of the most explosive receivers I've ever evaluated. He has a rare ability to go from a standstill to top speed and just blow past the entire defense. That makes him an elite deep threat, but also very productive after the catch. He ran a very linear route tree at LSU. It was a lot of goes, slot fades, and hitches. And on those routes, you see the effortless start-stop fluidity. He's the best double move route runner in this class, and he just has a rare ability to sink his hips and pump the brakes. But I actually think he could be one of these like Justin Jefferson, Stefan Diggs, Garrett Wilson caliber of route runners, where like he can hit you with a deep corner, a dig route. Like I think he can run the entire route tree at a high level. He has that kind of fluidity and change of direction ability. 
He needs to get a little more efficient with his footwork at the top of the route, but overall, I think he can do it all. And with my top two receivers, these are players that I really struggled to come up with weaknesses for. Probably the biggest weakness on Malik Neighbors' tape is beating press coverage, and I don't think he was particularly bad in that area. He mostly uses this shoulder dip technique where he's basically running away from the jam, and I think he has the foot quickness and agility to beat press coverage with his footwork. I'd like to see him diversify his release package and be a little more efficient getting upfield. Since he didn't even measure in at the combine, we're just going off of his listed weight, which is six foot, 201 pounds. If I had to guess right now, I would say 5'11 and 1 8 and 196 pounds would be his playing weight. So he doesn't have elite size, but he's not an outlier or anything. Even though he is my wide receiver too, I think having him over Marvin Harrison Jr. is perfectly reasonable. Just because somebody prefers one elite prospect over another one, that doesn't mean it's prospect fatigue or a smoke screen. I think Malik Neighbors would be wide receiver one in the majority of classes. But my top ranked receiver is Marvin Harrison Jr. out of Ohio State, six foot three, 209 pounds, elite fluidity and change of direction skills for a player of his size and he plays like someone whose dad was an elite receiver he's a polished route runner with extremely clean footwork he also has good hand usage as a route runner to disengage from contact he got held as much as any receiver that I've ever seen it felt like most corners he faced just accepted the fact that they weren't gonna be able to mirror him so the best course of action was just to hold on and hope that the refs didn't call that many holding penalties but especially in 2023 I thought he put a a lot of good stuff on tape as far as being able to separate through contact. As far as beating press coverage, I do think his frame puts him at kind of a natural disadvantage. It's a relatively big target for corners to land their punch. But outside of that, I really like everything about his release off the line of scrimmage. He has the full bag of moves and fakes to get around press. He does a great job changing pace and he has sudden acceleration, rhythmic footwork. He has really good initial burst to stack corners and he has good buildup speed down the field. If we're trying to pick holes in his game, he doesn't quite have the top speed of the LSU or Texas receivers, but I think it's hard to watch Marvin Harrison Jr.'s tape and come away with speed as being a weakness. And then he has elite ball skills and flexibility at the catch point. His contested catch rate went down from 60% to 43% over the last two years. But again, I think that's more of a quarterback stat where CJ Stroud's contested targets were accurate throws into tight windows. And this year it was a lot of underthrown or borderline uncatchable passes where he's just making a Hail Mary attempt to try to bring it in. He did have six drops this year and an 8.2% drop rate. That's not terrible, but there were some focus drops on his tape. And it's honestly a sign of how good of a prospect he is that I have an above average trait in the weaknesses column, but his fluidity sinking and opening on stop routes is just above average, nothing special, but it can get the job done. There was a play early in the Michigan game where it seemed like he kind of gave up on the route or didn't give a full effort at the end of the play and it got intercepted, but that wasn't really a consistent problem throughout the rest of his tape. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy the video, make sure to like and subscribe. Also, let me know in the comments any NFL draft prospects that you'd like me to cover. And if you want to see my full draft board as an interactive filterable table, I've got that up at a to zsports.com. The link to that is in the description.